And she followed up by saying, children is a nation I can't stand. I didn't know what to make of this. But I know nearly every day thereafter, I've got a clout on my head or a belt on my back or, or something, you know. Okay. But my grandfather, the benevolent old soul that he was, would say, well, don't you know your tante is? Don't worry. It's all right. It, it will pass. Everything will pass, he used to say, you know. And um, that went on for a long time. But I used to blame myself for this abuse because I used to wet bed. I was a bed wetter until I was about 13. And I didn't know why, you know, I mean, I, I didn't purposely <laughs> intend to share that with you, but it's true. <laughs> it's fact. And uh, so much so that I used to sleep on the floor on, on, on what you call bedding, you know, old clothes and so on. And it was the big, biggest challenge I had of my youth is to lick this thing. How do I get over wet in the bed? Maybe I w I'll try not going to sleep. So I sat on the floor with my own knees and eventually I fall asleep, right? And you know what? You wet the bed. But that faded out over about 12 or 13, by which time I had a, a self-confidence thing to rebuild, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so my father died, my grandfather died the same year, 1945, I remember. Um, but on my birthday, which was the 4th of July, he told me, um, he said, how old are you? And I said, 10. He said, hmm, you know, when I was 10, he said, I used to go to school in Rambert, from Rambert, they lived in Rambert Village and used to go to school. The school was about three, four miles away in Sipero Village and he used to go to school there. He had to walk every day, twice a day. And he said, this, his mother too died when he was young. And he was brought, raised by foster aunts. And what they did, they gave him a cake, a tray of sugar cake. They made sugar cake. And he'd go down to the market in San Fernando and sell sugar cake, I think for a penny or was it a cent, until he had a, they had accumulated $24 and they bought him a donkey. So he could ride his donkey to school every day. And that was my 10-year-old 10 year old birthday present from my grandfather, which I've never forgotten. But it has inspired me a lot. You know, in all kinds of ways. <laughs> Not about making money. <laughs> about riding donkeys. No, about riding donkeys, you know. But the, what donkey did for him was give him a sense of responsibility. He had to take care of the donkey, get grass for it, bathe it, see about it, and so forth. And when he go down to San Fernando, make sure it was tied in a proper place. A little ten-year-old boy. So I, I thought I amused on these things as I grew up. But he died several months later, and um, as the way I think, you know, I remember I had to sing Ave Maria at the um, <laughs> his funeral, and everybody was in. Because I sang it and I cried and I sang and cried and sang it, you know what I mean? And they talked about this for a long time. <laughs> um, but that was one of the things about his funeral, I remember. And he was buried in the same hole with his wife who had died in 1910. And I remember the, the being with the grave digger. Look at him dig the grave and he took out the skull, the top of the skull of my grandmother, who I never seen, of course. And he took out a, a had been like a hatchet he had, and scooped out dirt from in the skull, and he took a flask from it and poured rum in the skull and drank from it. So what is that? I don't know. Some kind of grave digger's ritual. 
<laughs> you know. <laughs> and then he took up the hair, you know, a long hunk of hair. It's a hair doesn't rotten, you know. A long hair, it was down to his elbow like this. And, you know, it's just his grandmother here. She was from some part of Africa that had people along here. Whatever. But um, I then, because my father had died and I was living with this ogre, um, <laughs> and she wrote, they, she used to have me write letters because she could, I don't know if she could write, she could dictate, but she, <laughs> but, um, and the first, I remember one of them, I'll tell you. She'd say, dear Flory, Flory was my aunt, my father's sister, I hope this letter reaches you shading under the branches of health as it leaves me suffering from rheumatism. <laughs> and I had to write this thing. I learned to spell rheumatism. <laughs> so, you know, you always get something out of everything, you know. <laughs> so I looked it up and I got rheumatism right. She didn't know. <laughs> um, so I used to write these letters for her. He should even discuss, discuss me, dictating me, to me, to write about how I bad. <laughs> Yeah, I write it. <laughs> I write it, you know. How three children is a trial. You know, I have to write that. You know. Eventually, it was agreed that I should go to San Fernando to live with another aunt and my three sisters. Um, I don't know if it's important, but the time I'm talking about was in the year of war. There was war. There was a, a world war. And we would, there'd be a lot of discussions about the war. And so there were volunteers in Point of Fear, not far from where we lived, and we would see them marching and all that sort of stuff. And at night, we would see big searchlight crossing the sky. If a plane only showed up, have it in the cross lights, and all this was quite exciting for us, you know. Um, that was one thing. But then I went up Freeport to live with Tanti Angie, as we used to call her, and then transferred to San Fernando with Tanti Maud. <laughs> one of my, <laughs> you don't hear those names again, do you? <laughs> Tanti Maud and Florence was up in Rambert Village and so on. And we lived in a big old house on Keats Street on the edge of opposite Paradise Cemetery. And that's where I saw Kitchener coming down. My, my cousin with whom I lived, he was Mervyn Christiani. He became the artist director at Lonsdale Hands eventually. He used to draw and stuff. He said, look, Kitchener, catch, catch, you know, catch, you know. <laughs> That's kitchen. What, 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 so you're a Calypsonian weapon from the country or what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have radio and stuff. We didn't know about kitchen. And stuff, you know? in fact, the one man in the village had a radio and a battery radio. And we heard Joe Lewis boxing in sometime 1944 something. With people in the road listening to the fight coming over. You know, life was very romantic in that. <laughs> so we got, we went to San Fernando and I went to boys school, boys RC school, and that is where I discovered what gang, gang warfare was, you know, because my cousin, who is my cousin, was, he was in a gang in school and he was putting up the fellas to beat up the country bookie, you know. <laughs> So I, that's me, eh? <laughs> yeah, and that a gang. I remember Sabga, Fuzi Sabga, and some other guys, you know. Because, you see, uh, I'm sorry to bring this up, but we come from a time when color was very important in this country. I don't talk about white and black. I talk about shades of brown and that kind of thing, you know, lighter. My cousin was the son of a half Dutch um, Guyanese guy who married my aunt. Yeah. 
So he was lighter like me, and you see, like about, 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 about like color, you know. So that gave him a lot more points than it gave me in any situation. They ganged up the guys to beat me because I'm from the country. I suppose they called it bully these days. I don't know. I said, ain't nobody ever beaten me, you see? So I, you know, I got a piece of wood and I was chasing all of them around the school, you know? <laughs> so they thought I was a bhajan from the country. I wasn't no bhajan, I was just fighting. I learned how to stand up for myself from a long, long time ago, you know? Boys' school, however, had teachers who recognized that here we have a new thespian. And I was always being called to recite the poem, to, I, which I don't even remember anymore. But um, that's what happened. And then um, the old question comes up to young ch children. Um, what do you want to be? So, yeah, so you mean beside a man? No. So you, yes, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, so... I discovered a trick. If you can say, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, you got treated better, right? <laughs> so I used to say, I want to be a doctor. Hmm? Yeah, that's nice. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. My aunts and so, you know, you, because remember, you are a foster child. These are foster parents. And you have to make them feel good somehow. So... But I didn't. What I really wanted to do, want to be, was to be like my father. And my cousin, my older cousin, he was an electrician in power station B in, in, in the um, refinery. My father was technical a foreman and everything. And my brother was a student apprentice going to be a you know, technician. Too. Your horizons weren't very far, you know. They were just there, you know, living in a village under a refinery. Besides, people in the, in, in the refinery, in the oil refinery, got more money than other people, you know what I mean? I remember the guys who were most popular in San Fernando were working in the store in San Fernando, in, down in um, on, on, on High Street, and their pay was $8 a week. I remember when I first started to work, I got $23 a week. <laughs> Big deal, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but before that, my un my cousin, Aubrey Jackman, who was from Port of Spain, so that wins you some points in South, if you come from town, you know. And he was an electrical kind of contractor. And San Fernando Hospital was being built. Did I skip um, presentation? <laughs> No, I'm jumping and coming back, right? And um, that's the first job job I had. They didn't have drills, electrical drills to drill concrete in those days. You drill concrete with a, a roll tool. You pong it and turn it and pong it and turn it and pong it. You, you remember that? Hey, you from the country? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, worked, I did that for about six months. And I used to get $5.17 for a fortnight. Fortnight is two weeks, as you remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that was great. But having left, having um, gone to boys' RC school, and we have met, um, well, it's not important. Um, I wrote... The, the exam to enter technical school, San Fernando Technical School, because I thought that that would help me, uh, you know, to be the technician that my father is or was. But, and I passed, and the first time I saw my name in the papers, yeah. yes, about 13, 12 or 13 of us passed for San Fernando Technical School. But my aunt, got on to me and said, you don't want to be a no mechanic with grease on your fingers. What's wrong with that? My father does it. No, 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 no. You go to college, man. You should go to college. 
what was college? College was high school, right? It wasn't college as you know it now, it's high school. But presentation college had just been become presentation from being St. Benedict's College. So um, she, I said, but my father can't afford being that money. She said, all right, I'll talk with him, I'll talk with him. She spoke with him and he said, yeah, man, go to college. You'll be the first one of our family ever went to college, right? So I said, okay, $16 a term, you know. Um, <laughs> Hey, we can find it, we can find it. <laughs> so I passed and went to college. As soon as I arrived, they put me in a form called 2A. <laughs> 2A was the experimental thing. We were going to do the senior Cambridge in three years, not the usual five years, right? Okay, no problem. First year I was in 2A, next I went in 3A, and then that class where we wrote the DCA. So, but my whole stay at Presentation College was torment because I never had textbooks. $16 was hard to come by to pay the school to see, and where he was getting money from to buy, well, copy book. I used to collect bottles and sell and buy collect stamps and sell and buy copy books. But textbooks was a, <laughs> something else, you know. So I used to ride down the road by um, John Jim Millard. And <laughs> there's um, Deborah's uncle. And we sit down by the lamppost reading my little Spanish missile <laughs> until he's finished with textbooks to study physics and chemistry and well so you know what the result of that was I passed five subjects you had to pass nine I passed English language English literature Spanish Spanish um, oral, oral and, and thing and Latin and rest was failed I did, I passed five subjects and didn't pass the other four, you know, which was the chemi chemistry and stuff. So my father comes over the weekend and tells me, how does it feel to be a failure? And I respected my father. I loved him dearly. So I did tell him what was in my mind, you know. And I just said, I'm, I'm not a failure. And you'll see one day I'm not a failure. You know, that's that. And he said, hmm, something. <laughs> Very profound statement. You know? um, but, you know, I had already developed the knack of not being put down by anybody. You know? And somebody look at you and tell you, you're a child, <laughs> I don't like you. <laughs> Because you're a child. <laughs> they say, well, you got a problem. I don't have a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I, there was nothing wrong with me. When I looked at myself, I saw pictures of me. I wasn't ugly. I still am not. <laughs> and people would people look at me and say, you're ugly, so-and-so. You know? And I'm supposed to respond to that. I said, no. I had friends. I had Two girlfriends when I was 10. Two, yes. One was Daisy and one was Betty. <laughs> Betty used to live down the street, way down the street. Way down, not the street, a lane. I hope I haven't told you the story before. And we used to, to, to meet by the chicken wire fence behind our house and talk. Talk about what I don't know. What 10 year olds talk about? You know, but Betty had a problem with her mother. Her mother would would be down in the back weeding and garden and saying, "Betty, you know, Betty, Betty, Betty said, yes, ma." They didn't have cell phones in those days. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and call her, "You cook the aloo for your father." 
Vicky would say, yes, ma. And to stop the listen, that's how you talk in the <laughs> I just have begun to have something to talk. It's just talking. Betty! <laughs> he says, he goes, yes, ma. You wash your food? Yes, ma. That's how the, the conversation goes. Okay. Betty looking worried now, you know. So we're talking and things. In fact, the, the conversation would get lessened and a little apprehensive, you know. Because Betty coming again to that. Yes, ma. You wash your nanny. <laughs> <laughs> I said, say yes, say yes. <laughs> I tell her, say, Betty! <laughs> you know? Yes, ma. You wash your nanny. Betty goes, no, ma. Oh, my God. <laughs> if you hear the torrent of obscenities that would come from that woman to this little poor little girl, you know? I mean, I don't want to repeat that. <laughs> but, you know? but so I thought, well, my life wasn't so bad. You know? <laughs> Nobody talked to me like that. You know? <laughs> and I used to feel, uh, I, I didn't know how, Betty is in the name for little girl, you know, in, 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 the, in the thing, but I never knew her name. And I didn't, she didn't, you know, just Betty, you know. And the other girl was Daisy, another one. Was pretty, pretty girl, little girl. Her mother was a prostitute. They lived next door to us, you know. So, <laughs> I don't know, but I never set up anything with, beat, with Daisy, any kind of talk. But I was getting to 11, and the guys were becoming aware of girls and stuff, you know. And we used to talk all kind of talk. You know? <laughs> uh, and my friends used to say, why you ask Daisy? I said, why you mad? <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, didn't bother about that because we moved. Thank God, we moved from, I think my, my family sold a wooden house, which was my grandfather's house. And we moved to another place. And then I moved to San Fernando and became um, a boys school. <sighs> We used to fight with, with Wesley at school boys, you know. That was between the boys' RC school. Wesley school was just down the road by near, near the library. So he used to look forward to fight, Friday fights. You know? yeah. Things that I saw around there was Butler. Butler came to the um, grandstand to talk. And the guys were heckling him. Butler was a, quite a character. He had come back from England where he went to, 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 to protest for self-government, home rule, as he used to call it. So a fellow in the, in the crowd was heckling Butler and saying, Butler, Butler, where do you, where do you home rule? You say you're going to be home rule. Butler said, you want to see home rule? Come on, come on, put your hand in my pocket and put your hand over so you will feel the home rule. <laughs> <laughs> that was, but that was quite a character. I think he was, he molded himself after a, 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 a pastor in the state called Father Divine, if any of you remember this guy. But he used to dress the same way, white suits and Panama hat and have women fanning him with all kinds of things, you know. And so I used to see Butler traveling in the back of a car with women fanning him and so on. If you read Aberdeen magazine in those days, you would have seen Father Divine, you know, on his. That was there. Yeah. Eh? yeah, yeah, yeah. They all influenced. Um, I left. In presentation, I met people like Basil Pandey. He was in the form above me. And Norbert Masson, who is now EBC head. Was, <laughs> Norbert was something else. I got up after having written um, Senior Cambridge. Before the results would come out, the next year in January, they put me up in 
it is I have a certificate where I met people like Norbert Marshall. Norbert was so indisciplined, they're funny. There were just five of us in the class. Three of us in front and two behind, Norbert and Bertley, a guy named Bertley, who I think ultimately became a priest, Leo Bertley. And he is talking, having a conversation, you know, and the teachers in front, they're talking geography and stuff. And he's a, uh, yeah, no boy, and yeah, I have no time with that, blah, 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 you know, same level at which the teacher is. <laughs> and I think the teacher was afraid of him because he was tall and so on. Guyton Pierre was that guy, teacher's name, very black guy. You know? But I, that's the lasting impression I have on Norbert Marshall. Disrespectful <laughs> and indiscipline and so forth.